Oh, great. All right, you guys can see that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So today, the plan is to discuss partial wave analysis for scattering. Um, all right, so uh, let's get this right. Um, okay, <clears throat> and so before, uh, what had happened is that we, uh, you know, just a, a recap of scattering is that what we have is um, some scattering potential, V of R, and we shoot a particle at it. Uh, and um, uh, with some incident K, uh, and then we get scattering. The particle bounces off. We get the scattered wave, right? And we have a detector up here. And the detector is located at R equals R, R hat. And that's my detector. And my detector has some partial, I'm sorry, some um, solid angle. And I get a bunch of particles going into my detector, dn is equal to, uh, that's the number of particles per time that go into my detector. And that's equal to the luminosity, just how many particles, the flux of incident particles, times the differential cross-section, the most important thing, times the solid angle of my detector. Okay, we've talked about this a lot, but I just want you to kind of have it all in your head. And so the big the question is then, the big scattering question for us at least is if we're given a potential V of R, then what is the differential cross section? Because you can see that the differential cross section tells me how many particles that potential will scatter into my detector. The most important thing, experimental thing. So, um, Okay, well, we, we know that from the Green's function, what we know is that since this particle has energy greater than zero for the scattering solution, then we know that the wave function um, of a particle with um, energy greater than zero, that's, that's moving, you know, that's going to hit my scattering potential is, um, it's going to be a plane wave, the incident wave plus the scattered wave. And the scattered wave has this amplitude in front, e to the i kr over r. Um, and we know then that this um, f of r hat is a function of f of theta and phi. Um, but it's really just f of theta because of the cylindrical symmetry of, of this situation. And, and you've seen that, you know, the cylindrical symmetry is simply this. I have a K incident. I hit this thing, I scatter off of it. I have my K final. And here's my detector. But you see that Definitely, it depends on, you know, you're going to get different results for theta, but everything is symmetric. All the phi's are the same. So there's no phi dependence. Um, and this then is the scattering amplitude the f of theta is the scattering amplitude. And that's the most important thing. And the reason it's the most important thing is because we figured out uh, by taking a close look at all this that the differential cross section is equal to the scattering amplitude squared. Yay, that's like a big gigantic result. And so that means that there's a really intimate relationship between the scattering properties, the differential cross section, and the structure of the wave function because f of theta is living inside of the wave function, right? 
is it's right here in the in the wave function. And and this is a picture of the wave function. So this is what the wave function looks like. This thing that I drew, this picture, you know, the, the lines and then the circle. Um, okay, so that's sort of the picture. And so then we see that uh, if I'm if I give you the potential, then and 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 then we want uh, in order to find uh, d sigma d omega, then you must find scattering amplitude. Uh, and so, uh, how do you do that? So, well, we know how. We use the Born approximation. The Born approximation. Um, and the Born approximation says that f of theta, we derived it twice <laughs> using two different techniques. It's so important. Uh, 2 pi h bar squared. Uh, it's this thing, basically the Fourier transform of the potential, which we discussed at great length in previous lectures. Um, but, and there's a big but, um, that. And so uh, we have, uh, we see that this only works for uh, weak scatterers. Exclamation point. Um, and so uh, what about when we have a strong scatterer? You know, what about strong scatterers? They exist. What about the strong ones? And the simplest strong one that I introduced already is the hard ball potential. Hard ball potential. So when you want to play hard ball, uh, then we have uh, the potential is equal to infinity for r less than some r naught and zero for r greater than r naught. And that's just the hard ball. And here's a hard ball with some radius, r naught. And I can shoot a wave at it. And you know that I should be able to get scattering off a hard ball and I get the outgoing waves. That doesn't look so hard. And yet we completely cannot uh, if I if I give you that and I say what's d sigma d omega, then you're like um, don't know, and there's nothing you can do. You're helpless because you don't know what to do. Um, all your tricks go out the window, and so what we need is a new trick to deal with this situation. A new trick to find f of theta. And f of theta will then, of course, give me my differential cross section, which is just f of theta squared. Okay, so what is the new trick? The new trick, of course, is the partial wave analysis, partial wave analysis. And I introduced this a little bit last time. Uh, and the partial wave analysis is not the most intuitive thing in the world when you first see it. The math is actually very straightforward. So you all can understand the math if you, you know, put your mind to it. It's not so hard. It's logical and, you know, one step follows after another. But the result is kind of, uh, when you first see it, not very intuitive. And uh, I, I introduced this already, but I'll just remind you the, the crux of the, of the partial wave analysis. Remember, the whole point is to find f of theta. Okay, that's the whole point. And that's what the partial wave analysis will allow us to do. But in order to find f of theta, we got to go through this really weird sort of reasoning, which is not very intuitive and yet is, is relatively simple. But you just got to step through it. Uh, and so what we have to do is we have to consider. Um, um, we have to. Um, take our scattering state, this is our wave function. I have an incoming, incoming, uh, and got my scattering, 
part, and then I have to write this, and and um, and I, what I have to do is I have to write my scattering state. Scattering state. And we like the scattering state. You know, it's very nice because it it gives us the, uh, the differential cross section. And we have to write this in terms of uh, 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 rotationally symmetric solutions. So it turns out that this is one basis, and this basis has no um, rotational symmetry. So the scattering state is a basis that has no rotational symmetry, and you can just look at it and see if I rotate it, it's not the same. Rotational symmetry means that if you rotate something, it looks the same. But there's no rotational symmetry for the scattering state. So this is one particular basis. And then I got to write it in terms of a spherical basis, a spherically, uh, rotationally symmetric basis. And so I got to come up with states and then I'm going to have incoming waves, and I'm going to have outgoing waves, and they have angular momentum because they are uh, rotationally symmetric. Rotationally symmetric uh, states, and so then they have. Um, well-defined angular momentum. But these guys, the scattering states have no rotational symmetry and so no, there's no well-defined angular momentum to a scattering state. And you can just see it already from this equation I've written in terms of pictures because this state on the left is equal to a sum of L's on the right. So each, uh, so this is, this thing is equal to a sum of partial waves. And we use that word partial waves because each, each partial wave has a well-defined L. So we see that the scattering state on the left is equal to a sum of rotationally symmetric solutions on the right, and each of those solutions has a well-defined angular momentum, and so each of those is a partial wave. That's that's where the word comes from. Um, and so this is, and so you can see that it, at heart, this is just a change of basis. It's, that's all we're doing. It's just a change of basis. We're starting with one basis and we're converting to another, and by doing that we will magically get the scattering amplitude. And so that's the beauty of this analysis. It's really pretty cool, actually. So we just have to go through the math of this change of basis, and then it'll all just become uh, apparent. Uh, but, the, uh, but I will just mention that when I do this analysis, when I go this change of basis, this little picture, the waves, these are the, in, I have incoming here, and then here I have outgoing waves, but the outgoing waves will be phase shifted. And so it turns out that this phase shift is the most important thing. And that is not obvious. I mean, until you do the analysis, I mean, if I was just to say the phase shift of the outgoing wave is going to determine the scattering amplitude. I mean, that's like, you'd be like, what? I mean, it's not obvious at all to me, at least uh, from the outset, it's not intuitive. And yet it's true. And it's quite beautiful and interesting, uh, and it works really nice. And it turns out that these phase shifts of the outgoing wave is the most important thing of all. And so I want you to be able to appreciate that and see it. I want you to see it, even if it seems weird to you and not intuitive, I want you to see it. So that's the point of today's lecture. So, um, okay, so let's do it. Let's do the change of basis. So, and you guys can hear me okay? Is everything good? Uh, am I coming through okay? Hello, anybody out there? Yeah, it's all good. Okay, good. Let me know if there's any problem. Um, okay, okay. So now let's do it. Um, 
um, let's do this change of basis. And so um, let's consider a free particle. And you guys already know that there are many possible bases um, because you know that in Cartesian coordinates, you write the free particle wave function as psi k is equal to, someone tell me, what is it? In Cartesian coordinates, what's the free particle eigenstate? Just speak up. E to the i k dot. Exactly. It's a plane wave. E to the i k dot r. Plane wave. Geometrically, it's a plane wave, right? I'm not going to draw it. I've drawn it many times. Uh, okay, but what if we do spherical? And you did this. I know you all did this, or 95% of you did this last semester whenever you took 137a. We always do spherical. Uh, we always do free particle and spherical coordinates. Spherical and spherical coordinates, you have the, the free particle eigenstate. Somebody tell me, does anybody remember what the eigenstate is for the free particle? Speak up. Would it just be spherical harmonics? Uh, yeah, but it but there's also, that's the angle component. It's also the radial component. What's and the uh, Hermite polynomials, I think, right? Or no. the Laguerre polynomials. No, no, no. It was even simpler. Laguerre. Laguerre, Hermite. Gee, so many polynomials. No. Is it the RNL and the YLM? RNL. Yeah, it was a radio. There's a radial. I'm, t I'm asking for the radial wave function. So, but you guys can. Oh, the uh, AL. Um, what was it, J, uh, JLKR or something like that, plus... Uh, Perfect. You nailed it. That's right. The Bessel function. That's it. Good. So that's a spherical Bessel function. Spherical Bessel function. I bet you all were hoping you'd never see that again. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking lots about spherical Bessel functions. And this is, of course, the uh, spherical harmonic. And so I just want you to like look at these things I've written down. I mean, they're totally different functions. One is a plane wave and one is a spherical Bessel function. The spherical Bessel function, geometrically, the way to think about it is that it's a spherical standing wave. Spherical, in the same sense that this equation, of e to the i k dot r is a plane wave. The j sub l of k r, the spherical Bessel function, is a spherical standing wave. And that is actually very important for today's discussion. So it sort of goes, well, it goes out, but it, it has no direction to it. It goes out and it goes in at the same time. Standing waves have no direction. So it's a spherical standing wave. Okay, so these two functions could not be more different. I mean, they're totally different, and yet they are both eigenstates. These are both solutions to h psi equals e psi, okay? They're both solutions to the Schrodinger equation. They're just different bases. It just so happens that you can have different functions that, that solve the Schrodinger equation, and that's the whole point of different bases. Okay, and so uh, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna convert between these bases. Um, and so let's take, a, let's, let's take a little review of the spherical, uh, Let's take a little review of the, of the Schrodinger equation, h equals e psi, in spherical coordinates. Okay, and here, let's do a little review. Uh, and so, um, let's consider, so here we have h is equal to the kinetic energy plus some potential v of r. And let's assume that we have a spherically symmetric v of r, okay? Spherically, symmetric, because most potentials are, uh, for point particles at least. Uh, and so let's consider spherically symmetric potential. And then you guys have all solved this. Um, you know that uh, the solution to the Schrodinger equation 
for this situation is dun, 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 dun. here it is psi I'll, I'll write E L M because it has a well defined energy, a well defined L, and a well defined M. It's a function of R, theta, and phi. And it's, um, well, I'll, I'll ask you, what's the, what's the angular component of this eigenstate? And this is for an arbitrary potential of, that has spherical symmetry. What is the angular part? There's two parts. There's going to be the radial part times an angular part. Okay, tell me the angular part, somebody. Spherical harmonics. Perfect. That's right. YLMs. What's the radial part? I mean, it's kind of a trick question because obviously it depends on what the V is, but. In general, what's the radial part? Vessel function. Well, that is that is a particular solution. You're right, that is a radial wave function, but that's a particular solution for the free particle when V is zero. I wanna know the answer for the arbitrary solution. So it's kind of a trick question. So let me write it like this. It's some function R that we don't know, but this function, but first, but let me. But I want to ask you, what are the quantum numbers of of this function? E and L. Yes, exactly. It has well-defined e, well-defined l, and it's a function of r. That is the radial wave function, and the radial wave function has to solve uh, the radial Schrodinger equation. And I'm not going to derive it because it was all you guys did it all last semester. Radial, and it's also quite tedious. Radial Schrodinger to to derive it. You know, it's a lot of the equations I don't feel like writing down. But you all, you all saw it done. It looks like this, negative h bar squared. I will, I'll write it, the radial wave, from the radial Schrodinger equation, but I won't derive it. But it's easy to derive, just a bunch of tedious algebra. r squared d dr, uh, r e l of r uh, plus, and it's a very important equation. Even though I'm not driving it, it's still very important. Plus h bar squared Okay, so that's it. Uh, and so, so, so you must solve this must solve to get R E L of R. And you guys did solve this. That's how you did the hydrogen atom and you solved it for, you, you solved it for two things. Actually you solved it for three things. Last semester, you guys solved it for a uh, simple harmonic oscillator. You solved it for hydrogen atom and you solved it for free particle. Pretty sure you did. Don't know if you guys actually, you might not have done the simple harmonic oscillator. I can't remember. I don't know. I can't remember what you guys did, but you certainly did it for the hydrogen atom and the free particle. I don't know about the simple harmonic oscillator. Um, okay. And so you guys know that if uh, V of R is zero, then that's the definition of a free particle. And, um, and then you get this radial function. When you solve that equation, it turns into a new equation. Does anybody know what the equation is when V is zero of that, that radial equation I wrote up there? The radial Schrodinger equation turns into a new equation when V is zero. Does anyone know the name of that equation? Can you tell me? Okay, it's called Bessel's equation. And the radial wave function when V equals zero is equal to what? Somebody tell me. 
Um, just the vessel function. Exactly. Spherical vessel function. Where uh, it has well-defined angular momentum. And K, of course, depends on what? What does K depend on? How do we define K? K depends on energy. Yes, exactly. So if you know energy, then you know K. So it's just convenient a shorthand for energy in that little way of writing it. Um, and so, okay, good. Now, I will point out, this is, and this is an aside, this will be important later. Note that uh, the actual solution is that, um, The actual solution is that the radial wave function is equal to um, vessel functions uh, plus something else. Neumann functions. Do you guys remember that? Uh, the the it's either Neumann functions or von Neumann functions. I can't really barely remember the name. I'll just call them Neumann functions. There's actually two functions. And, and the way to remember it is like this guy is kind of like si the sine solution, sort of like the sine solution. And this guy is kind of like the, the cosine solution. That's how you should remember it. So the, like the pattern is a pattern you've seen before. You've seen before that you have a second order differential equation, you solve it and you get that the solutions are cosine plus sine or e to the i k x plus e to the minus i k x. You guys have done that, right? It's like that, that, that famous pattern. Uh, but now you have a second order differential equation because it just has some little ever so slight differences. You, instead of sine and cosine, you get Bessel function and Neumann function but they're almost the same. Like the, the Bessel function is almost exactly a sine function and the Neumann function is almost exactly a cosine function with just some little nuanced differences, which, which matter of course, but I wanna put it into a framework that will help you to remember it. Uh, but then, but then uh, for a free particle, we have that um, uh, beta L equals zero. This guy goes uh, to zero. Do you guys remember why? Does anybody remember why beta goes to zero? Why that? Why we ignore that that one uh, as part of the solution? And and by the way, I'm I'm doing this for a reason. This is all going to come back and be important. Okay, this is not just I'm not just doing this just to torture you. Uh, does anybody remember why? we were able to, for the free particle, why it's a Bessel function and we ignore the, the, the second solution, which actually solves the equation. So it was due to a boundary condition, like maybe at r equals zero, s equals zero. Exactly, because that's what we always do for differential equations. When we throw away solutions, it's always because of a boundary condition. And the boundary condition is that we need that the radial wave function, the condition, is that we need the limit as r goes to zero of r e l of r uh, cannot equal infinity, and the problem is that the limit of um, the limit of this Neumann function is proportional to I have it written down here somewhere um, one over k r uh, to the l plus one. And so it diverges. That's good. You remembered it. That's very good. So uh, yeah, that's right. So that's why we that's why we keep the Bessel function, but we throw away the Neumann function for a free particle. And so let's re let's remind ourselves what it looks like. So for a free particle, then the radial wave function is equal to a spherical Bessel function. And it looks like this, let's draw it. Um, 
It's a function of R. It looks like this. It, it has this funky shape that you associate with decimal functions. It looks like this. Sort of like a dying oscillation. So you guys have all seen that before. So that's the that's what it looks like. Um, and let's remind ourselves a few um, properties of this uh, vessel functions. Some properties. It's important to know that um, the um, there's some different properties to it. And so one of the important properties is that if I go out and if I look at the, the asymptotic at large R, then it's important to know that J sub L of KR um, is approximately equal to a sine function. Sine, see, sine function. KR minus L pi over two, sort of shifted by that angle momentum, uh, divided by KR. Um, and so it's like a sine wave. And at small r, um, then I have uh, JL of KR uh, is proportional to uh, KR to the L. That's why it's a good solution because it does not diverge. Um, uh, and also, I will just remind you about this Neumann function that since I'm writing all these limits, let's remind ourselves that the limit for R goes to infinity of the Neumann function it is a, is, can you guess? The Bessel function is a sine wave at, as we get to big R. And what is the Neumann function? Somebody tell me. The cosine? Perfect, exactly right. It's the cosine. Minus. It has the exact same structure. It's just the cosine. OK. So OK, let me put. And I mentioned the Neumann function because we will be using it. Uh, maybe not this lecture, but next lecture. Um, OK, and so uh, this is the free particle wave function. I'm free. Uh, and so, but now there's something else to notice. Because you guys know that, look, you guys know that sine x equals 1 over 2i times e to the i kx minus e to the minus i kx, OK? So whenever you see a sine wave, you are, so this is basically just the same as saying a standing wave, because that's what a sine wave is. Standing wave is equal to um, a wave to the right plus a wave to the left, right? Because that's what e to the i kx is. e to the i kx is a wave to the right, and e to the minus i kx is a wave to the left. So whereas a uh, standing wave is sine. Sine of x is a standing wave. OK, you guys all know that. And so the same thing holds true in three dimensions. You, all of these simple one-dimensional properties have their three-dimensional analogs. And so now is the time for us to have to use those three-dimensional analogs. And it's really pretty simple because we have, we have um, uh, already, I mean, you can see it because look, we have that JL of KR is, I have to say, for, for large R and the asymptotic limit, everything, scattering is always asymptotic. So in the asymptotic limit, then JL is equal to this uh, sine uh, KR minus L pi over 2 over KR. And so you can you can see that there, there must be like, you know, sort of a then we should be able to write that in terms of uh, e to the i k r s, and so this is this is equal to. I, I, so I can write this as. Um, let me write it exactly. 
is equal to um, one over two. I'm going to write it in a funny way. Um, e to the i k r minus l pi over two <coughs> over i k r. <coughs> um, um, plus um, e to the minus i k r minus l pi over two over minus i k r. Okay, I just wrote it in a funny way, but you can, I think that it, it, you can see that it's pretty simple, you know, what I wrote. Shouldn't it be a minus and not a plus? Oh, you put the minus. No. Yeah, I put the minus in the bottom. And I did that for a reason, as you'll see in a moment. Okay, so you see that this works. And so it's pretty simple little thing to see. And it, it's just basically the same idea. It's just basically saying that I have a standing wave. The spherical vessel function is a standing wave. And it's equal to uh, an outgoing wave. Standing wave. And then, then I have an incoming wave. Lots of waving. Okay. Uh, and that's all it's saying. Okay. So it's just the same as like the sine wave is a left one moving guy and a right moving guy. Okay, so it's the same thing is true here, but now it's just in three dimensions. And now we're, we're doing, instead of X and Y, we're doing it in the radial coordinate. That's why I say outgoing, it's moving out radially for incoming, it's coming in. So um, I can just draw it like, you know, outgoing, like this guy is a standing wave. And so this guy is an outgoing wave. It's going out. And this guy is an incoming wave. Coming in. And so already you can start to see the makings of that picture that I was drawing before. But now let's do this. Let's give them names. Names. Let's give these waves names. Give the waves names. They deserve names. And so let's do this. Let's call this piece, let's call this outgoing piece. Um, um, e to the i k r minus l pi over two over i k r. Let's give it a name. What will we call it? Does anybody know? It actually has a name. Does anybody know the name? Okay, well, I guess I wouldn't expect you to. It's the famous Henkel function. Come on, how did you not know that? Henkel function. Everybody knows about Henkel functions. So this is the famous Henkel function, which is actually not that famous at all. <laughs> Nobody remembers what a Henkel function is. I'm just kidding. But it is a Henkel function. At that part, I wasn't kidding. So let's give it a name. It's useful to name it. By giving it a name, we get power over it. We know the name, now we have power over it. Uh, okay, so it's a Henkel function. Uh, okay, that's the Henkel function. And then, and then of course, uh, it's pretty obvious that the complex conjugate of the Henkel function is just this thing, e to the minus i, kr minus l pi over two over minus i kr. And so you see that the reason I did that is because now I can write, we see that this thing here for the vessel function, the spherical vessel function, I have a, you see I have a Henkel function. The outgoing wave is a Henkel function and the incoming wave is the complex conjugate of the Henkel function. I want you to see that. Okay, so now I can just write this. I can say that the vessel function is equal to, um, one half of the Henkel function plus the complex conjugate. See this, the math is easy. It's just like lots of little steps, okay? But it, it, each step is simple. So, you know, I know, and so hopefully you won't get too lost in it. And so I see then that the, so once again, I want you to just see 
that this that the Bessel function is the standing wave and the Henkel function is the uh, outgoing wave and the um, uh, Henkel function complex conjugate is the incoming wave. Incoming. Okay, so I just want you to see that. Um, and so now uh, let's keep going. Uh, and so now let's, so that's sort of like, these are like definitions that we will use. But now let's start talking about this new concept of phase shifts. What the hell is a phase shift and why is it important for scattering? Let's talk about phase shifts. What are they? And why are they important? It turns out they are the most important thing. And so when you first see it, you know, you're wondering why is a phase shift important for scattering? It, it really is not obvious at all. But once you think about it, then it does become obvious. So let's consider this. Let's, here's the idea. This is the idea. Let's start with a free particle and then let's add uh, a potential and see what happens. Then what happens? I'll tell you the answer. What happens is you get a phase shift. <laughs> That's what happens. You get a phase shift. So I'm actually telling you the answer, but let's see how that happens. You get a phase shift. So it's once somebody points it out to you, it's actually pretty obvious, I think. So let's let's look at it. So let's start with the free particle. Let's consider our radio wave function for a free particle. And let's consider a free particle that has some energy. Okay, so this is going to be, uh, you know, e greater than zero because we're talking about scattering. So e greater than zero, uh, and of course k is equal to square root of two me over h bar. And so let's consider uh, the zero. Let's consider the free particle. And this is, of course, this this variable is r. And so for a free particle, the wave function. is the uh, Bessel function. Okay, so that's the free particle. I'm free. And so he's a Bessel function and that's what a Bessel function looks like, right? Okay, now let's add a potential. And so I'm gonna add like the simplest potential. I'm gonna add this potential. Um, and let's add it to there. And so this potential is V negative, V less than zero. So that's an attractive potential, okay? So it's attractive, you've all seen it before. And it has a range, it's just out to this distance. I'll just call it um, R naught. And then it goes to zero. So it's just a square well, okay? Uh, so let me give it a name, V of R, uh, square well. Let's add a square well to the situation. And now I'm asking you a question, and it's a, it's a, spherical, a spherical square well. It's all in spherical coordinates. It's a spherical square well. And square wells suck, like they pull. It's attractive. It sucks. It sucks, man. And so it's, it's sucking, it's pulling. Okay, because that's what attractive potentials do. They suck, they suck, man. Um, okay, so uh, what happens then? So my question to you now is, what happens to the wave function? What happens? That is my question. So look at that vessel function. 
And I'm asking you, what happened? So let's break it up. What happens to the Bessel function for R greater than, for, uh, what happens for R greater than, uh, let's see, consider, consider R greater than R naught. Okay, so remember scattering is like a little thing. Like I have a little scattering potential, and I shoot the particle and it bounces off and goes far away. The detector is far away. So we got to consider the two situations separately, the close by situation, really close to the scatter, and then the far away situation close to the detector. So let's consider the far away situation. So I'll say R way bigger than R naught. What do you think, what happens, uh, what, does the, what does the particle see when it's far away from R naught? Does it see the scatterer? Does it, you know, does it feel like, wow, I'm just being sucked in by the big vacuum cleaner of that potential? Is it being sucked in when it's far away? Yes or no? No. Does it feel free when it's far away? I'm free. Does it feel free far away? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, it's free because there's no potential there. So. It, so the wave function far away, what do you, so what do you expect the wave function to be far away in spherical coordinates for this particle? Just intuitively, tell me. The Bessel function? Yes, absolutely. Why wouldn't it be? It's free. It's a free particle in spherical coordinates. It has a well-defined energy. Why wouldn't it be a Bessel function? Of course, it's a Bessel function, sure. Okay, now let's go close. consider R less than R naught, okay? Because now we're very close. So first we consider the far away and then second we consider close. This one's far, this one's close. So what happens inside that potential? What ha intuitively, without solving a bunch of hard equations, you know, don't go to that radial Schrodinger equation, it's so hard. Don't try to solve it, at least not now. What do you think intuitively happens to the wave function inside of that potential? And remember, it has a well-defined energy. This is the energy up here, E, right? We know the energy. What do you think happens in the well? Somebody tell me. I'll give you a hint. Before I put the well there, before I turned it on, I inside the well, I have this wave of the Bessel function. And that wave has a wavelength, right? There's some wavelength. Yeah, you see it? There's a lambda. There's a wavelength, right? Okay. You, are, you know, that's not surprising. You always get waves and wavelengths in quantum mechanics. But now I put a potential underneath it. What happens to that wavelength? Somebody tell me. Does it get shorter? Yes. You guys all know that. When you put a particle in an attractive potential, right, at some energy, you guys know it, the wavelength always gets shorter because now it has more kinetic energy, right? It's like faster, you know, when you think it all through. So, okay, good. So that wavelength will get shorter. Now, if this wavelength gets shorter, let's draw it. I'm gonna draw it. Um, let's draw it. Um, I'm drawing it. Okay, you see how I drew it? It has a shorter wavelength because it got more kinetic energy because I put a, a sucking potential underneath it. You guys have all seen that. Okay, so that, so that wave, that, but notice at zero, it has to be zero. It's sort of pinned there. And so the, and so like, if you were to describe geometrically what's happening to that wave function due to the potential, how would you describe that in simple terms? Can anyone just tell me, what is that wave function doing? It's getting scrunched. 
yes, it's getting pulled in. It's not pushed out, it's pulled in. Yeah, because it felt the vacuum cleaner of the potential. It's sucked, it's being sucked. So it got sucked in. Mm -hmm. And that makes intuitive sense, I think. So it got sucked in. But now let's go outside of the potential. And outside of the potential, the sucking feeling is gone. That nice sucking feeling is gone. And so now the particle is free. It's free. And so, and so inside the potential, the wavelength got shorter. Outside the potential, does the wavelength change? Yes or no? Somebody tell me. No. That's right. And you guys know that from analyses you did last semester, because, the, because now the potential is zero outside of the potential, and so the wavelength is unchanged. So let's draw the wave function outside of the potential. Remember, wave functions have to be continuous, right? So I can't like suddenly break the wave function. So when I suck the wave function in, you see it sucked it in, it sucked the whole damn thing. The whole wave function got sucked. The outside part had to get pulled with it. See, the inside part got sucked in because of the sucking feeling of the potential, but the outside part also got sucked in because the wave function is continuous. And so what am I drawing? What, so tell me, what is happening outside of the potential? Outside of the potential, the wavelength is unchanged, and yet it looks different. What happened to it? Somebody tell me. It's being shifted. Phase shift. Ah, ah, yes, it's phase shifted. That's what happened to it. It's phase shifted. That's the whole point of phase shifts. That's the whole point. The potential, the wave function outside of the potential, the whole point, the, the whole effect on the wave function due to the potential is that it phase shifted the wave function. It's a phase shift. So the effect of the potential on the wave function far away is, a, is that of a simple phase shift. And so uh, it's phase shifted. Uh, and so the new wave function is J sub L of KR uh, plus delta L. Because we're talking about the way, we're talking about one particular solution that has one particular angular momentum. So we're, we're talking about a particular uh, solution that has well-defined angular momentum. We're, in other words, we're talking about one partial wave. That's the language. We're talking about a partial wave. So, uh, so now you see. So it got phase shifted, and that's the phase shift right there. I'll give it a star, two stars. That's the phase shift. So I want you to see that it got phase shifted. It's a phase shift. And, I, and, it's, and it's important. It's plus delta L because it got phase shifted in, so then I add the plus delta L. If it got pushed out, it would have been a negative phase shift. I want you to you know, think that through. So, uh, so basically what I'll say is uh, attractive potential, then what it does, it sucks you in. So the phase shift for that energy is going to be greater than zero. But if it was a repulsive potential, then you would see that it would get pushed out by the same reasoning. And I, I just want you to see this is actually pretty simple because, um, you know, we didn't even have to solve equations. This is very intuitive. But, of course, there will be a bunch of equations. There always is in the end, right? Uh, okay. In fact, now let's do the equations. <laughs> okay. So let's um, – so now what we're going to do is let's do this all in equations, okay? So let's, let's consider the asymptotic – what is the effect – of the potential asymptotically on the wave function. Now let's do uh, what I just said in words. Let's let's do it in equations. And so uh, first, what we'll do is we'll start with um, v equals zero in the absence of a potential. The free particle is um, we see that we have the radial wave function is equal to the Bessel function. 
Um, and then, of course, we can rewrite that in terms of our Henkel functions, which you know are just the incoming and outgoing waves, right? Because the, the vessel function is a standing wave. H star, L of K R. Oh, that's the incoming plus the outgoing. Okay, uh, and so now that so that so now we're doing equations. What I just did with words. Now let's suppose that I turn on the potential. So now let's turn the potential on. So now the sphere, the potential does not equal zero. Okay, so we turn on the potential. Turn it on. And, uh, and so now we see that the, um, um, the radio wave function and for an attractive potential, well, it's gonna, it's gonna get phase shifted. So it'll be JL of KR plus Delta L. Okay, so, so that's what happens to the wave function uh, for a one partial wave. It gets it gets phase shifted and, and depends on whether it's attractive or repulsive whether I the phase shift is positive or negative okay but now let's do some manipulation of this so we're now I'm going to do some math I'm going to rewrite this so now let's rewrite this in a let's rewrite in a useful way rewrite in a useful way and the use the usefulness might not be uh, obvious at first but it will be later so just bear with me. Let's rewrite this in a useful way. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna write it like this. Uh, I'm gonna notice that if this is a good wave function, then this is also a good wave function because I can always multiply a wave function by a phase factor, right? That's okay, it doesn't change the physics if it's a global phase factor. Uh, so it's E, I'm gonna write it like this. So this is perfectly fine. My, if, if my wave function is that, then it can also be this. And I'm doing this just to make the math work out a little better. You could like worry about the physical interpretation later, but this is also an, it's, so this is an eigenstate. So, so if, if one is an eigenstate, then the other one must be an eigenstate too. Okay, I hope that's not too confusing. I mean, it's just multiplied by a global phase factor. Um, now I'm going to do some trickery because now I'm going to rewrite it and I'm going to notice that, and I'm doing this for a reason guys, you know, this is, so just bear with me. So I'm going to notice that I have this E to the I Delta L out here. So this phase shift written out here where I just, I just took the phase shift and I also put it on the outside, but now on the inside, the, this vessel function, I can rewrite it in terms of the Henkel functions. So now let's do that. Because, this, you know, and here you can see the Henkel functions up here, you see them. So now let's write them out in, in all their glory. So the Henkel function, first I have the incoming wave, the, the complex conjugate Henkel function, which is an incoming wave. I'm just rewriting the Bessel function in terms of Henkel functions, and I'm just writing it out. But because my argument has a phase shift and I got to add that phase shift to the argument of the Henkel function. All right, nothing fancy here. I'm just writing it all out. And now I'm gonna do the other one, <clears throat> the regular Henkel function. Uh, Kr minus Li over two plus delta L um, over I Kr. Okay. And so that's just, uh, you know, one half H star L of KR uh, plus H L of KR. Okay, so I just wrote it out like that. Um, and now um, I'm, I, what I can do is I can move this guy in. He multiplies both of these guys. Um, oops, oops, I think I made a mistake. Okay, yeah, let's, I'm gonna, 
just erase this just so I'm, I, I think I didn't write my phase shift correctly. Let, let's just leave that part out. And so what you see here is that, um, did I get this all correct? Mm, I screwed up a little piece of algebra here. It's written incorrectly in my notes. Oh no, it's just written correctly. Yeah, 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 no, it's all correct, okay. So what you see is that um, th this guy, it, the, the phase shifts are gonna cancel for the first term. So for the first term, it's gonna cancel e to the minus i, kr minus l pi over two, over minus i kr. But for the second term, it's gonna add up uh, e to the i kr minus l pi over two plus two delta l over on kr okay i just want you to see that there's nothing fancy there okay just i just multiplied it through and in the one search case it cancels in the other case it it adds twice uh and so then i want you to see then that if you write this out then you see that this um let's see did i get all my factors of two correct i'm sorry i got a little factor of two here one half one half. Sorry, I'm just got to get all the little factors of two right. And so now I have one half of, and this guy is the Hankel function, complex conjugate. But this guy is going to be, um, what I can do is I can bring out this phase shift. And I can see that I have E to the i uh, two delta l h l of k r. Okay, so I just want you to see that. So um, that's what we get, and so we see that the the outgoing wave is phase shifted. So this is just another way of writing a phase shifted Bessel function, because you see that what happened is that what the potential did was the potential, the Bessel function is a standing wave, right? Standing wave. And so the standing wave got phase shifted by delta here, right there, right? There it is. The standing wave got phase shifted by delta, and all I've done with all this little map here, I've just shown that if I translate the, sh the phase shift of the standing wave, then that then I get uh, then I can interpret that as that the uh, one of the traveling waves is not phase shifted, but the tra but the traveling wave in the other direction has to be phase shifted twice by by twice the amount of the standing wave. All right, it's just some little simple algebra of standing of standing waves. So because I'm I'm rewriting the stand the, I'm rewriting the phase shifted standing wave, and I'm saying that the and I can rewrite it in this way such that the incoming is not phase shifted, but the outgoing is phase shifted by twice the amount. Outgoing is phase shifted by twice the amount. Okay, so this is just some algebra, but this is a very useful result that we will use. Um, okay, and so basically now we're ready to do the partial wave analysis. Uh, oh shit, I don't know if I'm giving myself enough time. Uh, I gotta finish this though, because I'm not gonna redo this next time. So, um, so uh, hopefully I won't have to go over, but if I do, I'm just gonna do it. Uh, and you guys, if you need to leave, you guys can just uh, watch the recording. Uh, I hope I'm recording this. Um, I think I remember to record it. Uh, okay, so now we're ready for the partial wave analysis. So this now we're ready to do the whole thing that we, we've geared up and we're ready to do the partial wave analysis.
the partial wave analysis is this. Uh, basically, what we're going to do now is um, we want to take the scattered state, and I warned you we would do this. We want to take this, the scattering state, psi k is equal to e to the i k dot r plus f of r hat e to the i k r over r. And we want to write it in terms of uh, a, uh, 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 a sum of um, rotationally symmetric functions, rotationally symmetric states. This is what we want. This is the whole point. Uh, uh, so this is what we want. And then when we do this, then something very beautiful will happen because by doing this, then we will get, this will lead us to get an expression for f of r hat is equal to some function of the phase shifts. This is what we want to derive, okay? That, that is the end result. Okay, so, so let's do it. And so this is how we start the analysis and we're ready to do it. Let's consider first, let's consider the Schrodinger equation for a free particle. And that means that V equals zero. And so for a free particle, we know the solution is gonna be this, psi k of r is equal to a plane wave, right? For a free particle, that's, I can write it as a plane wave. You guys know that. Okay, but now here's the thing that you did not know. This is a tricky little thing, but it's it's just a math trick. It turns out that I can write a plane wave in spherical coordinates. <laughs> Did you know that? Of course you can. You, you know, I can write a plane wave in spherical coordinates. Uh, and this is how you do it. Uh, and I'm not going to derive it. Uh, I'm not even sure I ever have seen it derived. No, I think I did. I think it's in Jackson's Electricity and Magnetism book, <clears throat> graduate level e and book. Um, I think I saw it derived there once 30 years ago. So here, L equals zero to infinity. So that's, we can sum over L, I to the L, 2L plus one, and P sub L of cosine theta. Somebody tell me what's P sub L? What's P sub L? Legendre polynomials. Exactly. These are the Legendre polynomials. Um, J times the spherical vessel functions. Now, this is our starting point. And this is just, uh, this is just a fame, this is a famous expansion that we're just gonna assume is true. So, you know, we got it out of a math book. It's, you can see it derived in Jackson's e &M book. Okay, but we're gonna take it as a starting point. It's just, you know, it's just an equation that it's just a, it's an identity. Okay, so let's, let, let's rewrite this identity. And so let's, uh, let's rewrite it as this, psi k of r. The, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite it because these, these um, the Bessel function can be written in terms of Hankel functions. So let's do that i to the l, 2l plus 1, the Legendre polynomial, cos theta, uh, times the Hankel function. So it's 1 half times h, I'll make sure I do it the same way as in my notes, sub l of kr plus h sub l of kr. Okay, I've just rewritten this equation, it's no big deal. Uh, but I, but I do I, but I do want you to, to notice that this is an incoming wave, incoming, and this is an outgoing wave. Okay, uh, and so now now that's for v equals zero. Now turn on v of r 
not equal to zero, let's turn on a potential, then what happens? Can someone tell me what happens? <clears throat> it gets shifted. What? It gets phase shifted. What gets phase shifted? Um, the outgoing. That's right. By how much? By two of the phase shift. Yes, by twice the phase shift of the standing wave. That's right. Yeah. Because the phase shift is always the phase shift of the standing wave. So the outgoing wave gets phase shifted twice the phase shift of the standing wave. So when someone says, Phase shift, you know, the scattering phase shift, they're always talking about the phase shift of the standing wave. So, okay, so then what, so let's do that. So then we get a phase shift. The outgoing wave, outgoing is phase shifted by two delta L. Okay, so let's write that in the equation. Psi of K of R is equal to L equals zero to infinity, I to the L, 2L plus one, EL of cosine theta, one half. The incoming does not get changed, but the outgoing does, E to the I, two delta L, H sub L of KR. Okay, so that's what happens. Um, okay, so far, that's good. Now let's do a little trick. Let's do the trick. We'll do the add by zero trick. Let's do the old add zero trick. Zero is equal to, and you've all seen this trick before. We've all done it sometime or another. We're gonna add zero. We're gonna do the old add zero trick. So we're gonna add zero to this expression inside there because it's still an equation, I can add zero to it. So when I add zero to it, uh, it looks like this. Psi k of r um, is equal to one half the sum l equals zero to infinity, uh, i to the l, two l plus one, d sub l of cos theta, h star sub l of k r, uh, plus h sub l of kr plus uh, e to the 2i delta m times h sub l of kr plus h sub l. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, no, that's not plus star. That would be minus because I'm adding zero. Can't all be plus. They are. Okay, I just added zero. You guys can see it, right? I got that term and that term, I just added zero. Okay, now this is really cute because now I can break this up into two sums. So it's just math, but it's cute math. Something really cute happens. And I see then <clears throat> that I have, um, 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 -da -da. so I can, I can write this as uh, the sum over L equals zero to infinity, uh, I to the L, 2L plus one, uh, PL of cosine theta, one half of H star of L KR plus H sub L of KR. I got that, but then I can also say plus, and I can do the sum again, and it's gonna be, um, the, the second sum I'm going to write differently, I'm going to write like this, one half times the sum over um, oh, it L, um, I to the L, 2L plus one, PL of cos theta times uh, E to two I delta L minus one, times h sub l of kr. Okay, all right, you guys see that? So, but now I want you to notice something. What is this guy? That's Somebody the, tell me. That's the plane wave. Yeah, 
Exactly, because this guy is the J sub L of KR. And so this thing in the circle is just E to the I K dot R. Okay, that part is E to the I K dot R. So, so this thing then, so basically I have uh, psi K of R is equal to E to the I K dot R plus this messy stuff, plus this messy thing. Okay, what the hell is this messy thing? Let's take a close look at it. Uh, it's actually kind of cool to notice. So the messy thing, let's look at the messy thing. Let's notice, before we write out the messy thing, let's notice some little tricky things. Let's notice that E to the 2i delta L minus one, equals, and this is just a little math trick, E, I'll just write it out, E to the I delta L times E to the I delta L uh, minus E to the minus I delta L, which is equal to E to the I delta L times 2I sine delta L. Okay, that's just some simple math. You guys could all have figured that out if I gave you a few minutes. Also, let's notice that H sub L, the Henkel function, is just an outgoing spherical wave. It's e to the i kr minus L pi over 2 divided by i kr. That's just the definition of the Henkel function. And let's also notice that i to the L is going to be equal to e to the i pi over 2 to the L. That's what i is, is equal to e to the plus uh i l pi over two okay and so now let's plug these things in to this upper expression so we just figured this these little math tricks out and now let's plug them into here and so let's plug them in because here i'm going to have uh this guy is e to the i l pi over two uh, this guy is uh, e to the i delta l 2i sine delta l. And this guy is going to be e to the i kr minus l pi over 2 divided by i kr. Plug those things in. To this weird expression and now let's just notice that we get cancellation i want you to see that this guy is canceled by this guy uh let's keep going what more is canceling uh yeah 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 this guy is canceled by this guy um what else cancels I guess that's all that cancels, but that's enough. Oh, and the two cancels, yeah. This two cancels with this two. Do you see that? And so that means, put it all together, and we're gonna get this psi sub k is equal to e to the i k dot r, plus that big, ugly, messy thing is now can be written in a no, more neat form. It's equal to this. Um, it's going to be, uh, see, I, I still have that one over k, so I'm rewriting that term. It's going to be, I can write it like this. It's going to be one over k times the sum of l equals zero to infinity uh, times 2l plus one times p sub l of cos theta times e to the i delta l the phase shift times sine delta L, and then, but this whole thing is going to multiply, the, and the Henkel function, the leftover part of the Henkel function is E D I K R over R. Okay, and, and I just want you to see that, that it, all, it all is kosher, it all came up from those little cancellations. But that's sort of funny, because now I want you to notice that, what the heck, I want you to notice something. Psi of that's k, all. yeah. Oh, that's the scattering amplitude. 
Exactly. Because psi of k is e to the i k dot r plus f of theta e to the i k r over r. And so we have just derived that this mess of stuff is equal to what? Say it. Somebody say it. Yes, because see this is that and this is that. And so these things have to be the same. So that means that, and, and that's the answer. F of theta is equal to one over K sum over L times two L plus one piece of L of cosine theta E to the I delta L sine delta L where those are the phase shifts. We've just derived the scattering amplitude. And that means then that D sigma D omega, the differential cross section is equal to that thing squared. And notice that the only thing we don't know, the only unknown is what? Say it. The phase shift. Exactly. And so the phase shift determine everything. So that means that what we've just derived is that the differential cross section is equal to some weird function of the phase shifts. Okay? And so the phase shifts are the most important things. And so the big question on your mind should be, how do I get the phase shift? <laughs> yeah, that's the right question to ask. And we'll do that next time. We'll get the phase shift next time. Okay, that's the end, guys. Thanks, Professor. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.